Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome. Uh, my name is Alan Lowe. I'm the executive director of the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library and Museum, and we're so glad to have you here this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. What's well, going to be a really fun program. Uh, before introducing our terrific speaker, I want to thank, first of all, thank all of you for your support of this institution. We're proud to be part of this community as we work every day to preserve and carry on the legacy of our greatest American, Abraham Lincoln. As you know, every day we do that through exhibits, through our research collections, through research and oral history, through educational and public programs. In so many ways, we want to serve this community and the nation and tell the story of Lincoln and of Illinois. I'm especially proud of our uh, current special exhibit, uh, Cubs versus Cards, The Rivalry, which I hope you got to see. Uh, if you didn't, it's going to be open for a while after the program tonight as well. Uh, we did that uh, exhibit in partnership with the National Baseball Hall of Fame, the Cubs, the Cards, and Major League Baseball. I'm really, really proud of, of the result. It's been popular with baseball fans and with history fans and with baseball history fans. So we're kind of hitting on all cylinders. Um, in addition to tonight's program, we have several other things going on here over the coming weeks that are related to that special exhibit. Our next Illinois History Forum, which we have here on a regular basis. The next one is dedicated to baseball, specifically the Chicago Black Sox scandal. Uh, baseball historian Bob Sampson from Millican University will lead that discussion. He'll focus on the scandal as described in the classic book, Eight Men Out. It takes place on Thursday, May 11th at noon in our multi-purpose room over in the library. It's a free event. Uh, feel free to bring your lunch or just drop by for what will be a really fascinating discussion. Then on Tuesday, May 16th, we'll hold another of our really popular Evening with the Creators. Um, this one looks at how we created the rivalry exhibit about the Cubs and Cards. You'll hear from our state historian, Sam Wheeler, who's a member of our staff here, along with senior curator Tom Scheiber from the National Baseball Hall of Fame and representatives from both the St. Louis Cardinals and the Chicago Cubs. The rivalry was a result of that amazing cooperative process with all those folks, so I think you'll be really fascinated by the stories they have to tell. That evening with the creators will take place here in Union Theater at 6 p.m. on May 16th. It's free, but we do recommend that you make reservations by going to our website, presidentlincoln.illinois.gov. And also, though it's a bit further in the future, don't miss on June 22nd, I know that's still a ways out, on June 22nd here in Union Theater, we'll have a great presentation by Talmadge Boston. Talmadge is an old friend of mine from Dallas who, in addition to being a terrific lawyer, is also a terrific historian of baseball. And he'll be here on June 22nd to talk about baseball in the Civil War era. So don't miss that. Now, uh, turning to tonight. Uh, I met Tim Kirchin not long before I left my last post as director, of the, uh, as director of the George W. Bush Library and Museum in Dallas, Texas. Tim was there to speak at SMU. And I was fortunate enough not only to hear him speak, but to talk with him a bit beforehand. And I recall very, very well that we spoke briefly but very intensely about the Pete Rose, Bud Harrelson brawl in the 1973 National Championship Series. <laughs> now, some of you may remember that. That fight, which ensued after Rose, may have slid a bit hard into Mr. Harrelson at second base, is one of the most famous fights in baseball history. As a young Arden fan of the Big Red Machine, I was completely without reservation on the side of Pete Rose in that fight. And I admit, when I spoke with Tim about it down in Dallas, very briefly, uh, some, what, 43 years after the fact, I felt myself getting agitated again with Harrelson. <laughs> uh, those emotions, that loyalty, those memories are still very fresh, and I was fortunate not long after that uh, to see the Reds win two series in 75 and 76. I shouldn't really say that in a room full of Cubs and Cards fans, I'm sure, but that was the baseball I grew up with. I, as with so many of us, baseball was an important part, is an important part of my life, uh, and there's no better person in the world today to talk about our beloved sport than Tim Kirchin. Uh, Tim, as I'm sure you know, is a true baseball fan and expert. He, he joined ESPN in 1998, where he continues today to offer insightful analysis of the great American pastime as reporter for Baseball Tonight and Sports Center, as a senior writer for ESPN the magazine, as a frequent guest on ESPN radio with shows like Mike and Mike. Prior to ESPN, Tim was senior writer at Sports Illustrated and a sports writer for the Dallas Morning News where he covered my now American League team from being in Dallas, the Texas Rangers, and for the Baltimore Sun, where he covered the Orioles. He's authored three books. The latest, I'm Fascinated by Sacrifice Flies, came out in May of 16, which I know many of you all got out there. By the way, if, if you still want to order that for, for Tim to sign and send back, uh, we will have folks out there in the lobby afterwards if you want to still order, uh, order that book. 
He also wrote, uh, before that he wrote, Is This a Great Game or What? that came out in 07, and before that, America's Game, which came out in 2000. So no, uh, also I should say tonight Tim is going to give remarks, but we want to encourage your questions, so we're going to leave a lot of time uh, for Q&A. So be ready, have your questions at the ready uh, for Tim after his, after his remarks. So no one knows this game uh, that we all love better than Tim, and we're so very, very fortunate to have him here tonight. Please welcome Tim Kirchner. Thank you, Adam. Thanks for everyone for coming, waiting so long in line. Thanks for buying my book. <laughs> Word about my book, by the way. It's a Valentine for baseball fans. There is no heavy lifting in this. Hopefully it will make you smile, it will make you laugh. It's just like my last book, Is This a Great Game or What? So after I wrote my last book, my nephew, Brett, had to do a, for his fifth grade assignment, he was 11, he had to do a story comparing and contrasting two pieces of literature in history. So of course he took Uncle Tim's book, Is This a Great Game or What?, which is a bunch of stupid, goofy stories about baseball, everybody laughs, everybody smiles, and he compared that to The Odyssey by Homer. <laughs> So my cousin Julie <laughs> says, look, there are homers in both of them, but I think we should find something a little bit more comparable. So Brett found something else. All three of my books, though, have a common theme in them, that baseball is the best game. I knew that when I was six years old, and now that I'm 60, I know that better than ever. This is the language we spoke in my house growing up. This isn't just something I got interested in after college. This was a part of my life in every single way. And I went to Walter Johnson High School, named after the greatest pitcher of all time. I played on the baseball and basketball team, but I also wrote for the school paper. It was called The Pitch. <laughs> and I did a little work for the yearbook. It was called The Wind Up. But I always felt it was very symmetrical that I made a career out of baseball after going to a school named after the greatest pitcher ever. And my career is now almost 40 years in baseball, and I'm just warning you, you don't want to be like me, seriously. Here's how my life works. It's a great life. But I go to a party, true story. The guy comes up to me not long ago, doesn't even say hello. He meets me at the door as I'm standing there with my wife and says, 14 guys in Major League history have hit 40 home runs in a season with four letters or less in their last name. So my wife looks at me and she knows I'm completely done now because I have to get all of these. And believe me, when I got Wally Post at 1.30 in the morning, it was like the greatest day of my whole life. And in doing my job, of course, there's a chapter in this book about this, I clipped out every box score of every game for 20 years. As an adult, I did this, and I taped them into these little notebooks that I would carry around with me for an entire season like a fifth grader in social studies class. So I never missed a day in 20 years, not one day. A streak, I think we would all agree, is way better than anything Cal Ripken ever did. <laughs> so one night at 11.30, it, I woke up horrified. Oh my God, I forgot to do my box score book. And I got out of bed, I went in my office, and I cut out all the box scores, and then I went back to sleep, and there's my wife looking at me with that look like, how could I have married such an unfathomable geek like this? <laughs> But the beauty is, I meet people like me all the time. And some of them are sitting right here. And this is why I do what I do, is there are people like this, especially in this part of the country. I'm not just saying this because I'm here. Going to Bush Stadium is like the coolest thing ever. I met a lady, seriously, I met a lady a couple of years ago, it was a big Cardinal fan. She drives a car that looks like a baseball with like seams all over it. That's the car she drives. She's 70. 
And Cub fans, God bless our Cub fans, they finally won. And after they won game seven, I go back to my hotel in Cleveland, and there is a man my age, I'm 60, and he's crying at two o'clock in the morning, standing next to the elevator. So naturally, I ask him, are you okay? And he goes, well, I just got off the phone with my father. He's 85 years old. And we cried together for 15 minutes on the phone. And that's what it means to be a Cub fan and to be a baseball fan. And that's why I do what I do for a living. Because it's the best game, and I'll argue this with anyone, it's the best game because of the people that you meet in the game. A few years ago, I got to go to the White House for this huge luncheon for Hall of Famers. And it was assigned seating, and I show up, luckiest man on the face of the earth, and I've got Brooks Robinson sitting to my left, and Stan Musial sitting to my right. And I can tell you, these are the two nicest Hall of Fame players, if not baseball players, I've ever met in my entire life. So halfway through lunch, Stan Musial looks at me and he goes, would you like an autographed picture of me? <laughs> and I'm not a collector, that's not what I do. All my stuff is right up here. It'll never go away either. But of course, when Stan Musial offers, you take it. So two days later, an autographed picture from Stan Musial showed up at my house. And then two years later was the next time I saw Stan the man. And he looked at me and he said, how'd you like the picture? <laughs> he remembered. And then, of course, Brooks Robinson, having grown up in Maryland, where I grew up, in the late 70s, I went to a like a retirement dinner for Brooks Robinson. One of my sports writer friends made a speech. And this is the late 70s, Reggie Jackson had just gone to the Yankees. And my writer friend said, in New York, they named a candy bar after Reggie Jackson. Here in Baltimore, we name our children after Brooks Robinson. <laughs> and by the way, Brooks Robinson, greatest defensive third baseman of all time, right-handed thrower, right-handed hitter, he writes, with his left hand, and he eats with his left hand. So when you watch him on tape making that play like this at third, it's because this hand works. And there's so many ambidextrous players out there, but Davey Johnson was with the Orioles, and the first time he ever met Brooks Robinson, he said, oh my gosh, he writes with his left hand. He eats with his left hand. So Davey Johnson told me, he said, I wrote with my left hand for a year to see if it would make me a better second baseman. <laughs> he said it didn't work at all, but I had to try. The people you meet. I remember Alan talking earlier today about Pete Rose beating up, you know, Bud Harrelson. The only Pete Rose story you ever need to hear, and I'm going to clean this one up a little bit, but Pete Rose is one of the great players ever, but he went to prison for four months for tax evasion. He comes out, he's 51 years old, when his son comes to pick him up at prison. So he says to his son, the first thing he says to his son is, is there a batting cage near here? And his son goes, yeah, there's one right down the street. So they go to the batting cage, and Pete Rhodes, age 51, goes to the proprietor and says, what's the fastest machine you have here. And the guy goes, over there, 85 miles an hour. If you haven't seen 85 lately, by the way, that is really flying. So Pete Rose gets in the cage. By this time, there are like 30 people gathered around the cage because the hit king is in the batting cage. So the first pitch comes in, a reminder, 51 years old, been in prison for four months. The first pitch, he hits a line drive right back at the pitching machine. Textbook, hits it as hard as a man can hit it. He looks at the gathered people, he takes his bat, he throws it to the ground, and he says, some things never frickin' change, and he walks away. <laughs> and that's Pete Rose. It's the best game because the players, at least some of them, actually look like us. I just saw Dustin Pedroia the other day, okay? He's an inch and a half taller than me, 
And I don't know if you've noticed, but I am really small. <laughs> my hands, I have really big hands for a little guy. They don't do me any good, by the way. But my, my hands are twice as big as Dustin Pedroia's hands. And he was the MVP of the league and is still one of the best players in the game. Tony Gwynn's hands, the great Tony Gwynn. My hands are twice as big as his hands. And he is the best hitter since Ted Williams. If you saw Greg Maddox with his shirt off, oh my gosh, you wouldn't even think he was an athlete. And yet he's one of the five greatest pitchers of all time. And Pedro Martinez, the great Pedro Martinez, told me when he was in the minor leagues his first year, he weighed 138 pounds and he threw 93 miles an hour. And I said, Pedro, 138? I only weigh a little bit more than that. How can you do that? And he goes, well, God gave me that. And that's the way it works in baseball. You can either play this game or you can't. And it's the best game because the players are so unbelievably good. No matter how good you think they are, trust me, multiply it by 10, and that's how good they really are. So George Brett is one of the great hitters ever, played for the Royals, Hall of Famer. He was on the disabled list one year with an ankle injury, but they, he went to the team's golf tournament, and he's standing on the 18th green, welcoming all the groups that come through. So one group decides to have a little fun with the guys on the green, so they hit into the green while everyone's putting on the green. So George sees the ball coming from 150 yards away. True story. He drops his crutches. He takes a putter, and he hit the ball, a golf ball, out of midair with a putter blade that's that wide and hits it 150 yards back down the fairway. <laughs> I said, George, no one could do that. I, who do you, I can't believe that. He goes, well, it happened. And he said it was 1980. And that was the year he batted 390. And every time he swung at anything, he hit it really hard. That's how good our players are today. And they have to be great because the game is so impossibly difficult to play. I am really, really amused at people, sorry, who think they could actually get a hit off of Carlos Martinez in a baseball game. Are you, are you kidding me, really? If anyone in the room, with all due respect to everyone in here, if you get 100 pitches from any big leaguer, all right, we'll take Max Scherzer of the Nationals. You are not putting a ball in play. You are not making contact. That's just the way it works. Nobody really thinks they can guard Steph Curry. Nobody really thinks they can tackle Adrian Peterson in the open field. But they think they can get a hit off a major league pitcher. I am here to tell you there is zero chance of that. <laughs> but Jeff Conine, who's the greatest player in the history of the Marlins, he told me that a buddy of his many years ago said, I want to catch Rob Nen. If you remember Rob Nen, he threw like 100 miles an hour with a slider that went like this. So Conine said, you can't catch Rob Nen. He would kill you. And the guy goes, no, I think I can do it. So Conine goes, OK, here's what we'll do. We'll go to the picnic today, and if you can catch me, Conine, he said, then maybe we'll get some gear on you and we'll see if you can catch Rob Ned. But you can't catch Rob Ned. So first pitch at the picnic, Conine tells me, he throws it maybe 75 miles an hour. And he said, first pitch, I broke his watch. He hit it right here. That's how much he missed it by. And he said, if I hadn't broken his watch, I would have broken his wrist. And the guy said, well, maybe I can't catch Rob Ned. Really? We're not sure about that. And because it's so hard, you have to compete at it so hard. And our baseball players are the most competitive people that I've ever met in my life. Mike Trout is a lunatic when it comes to competition. And he's the common denominator of all the great ones I've ever met. Whatever the game is, they have to win. So, a few years ago, Raul Abanez, who now works for us, invented this game in batting practice where if you hit the screen 
you know, down the first baseline, you get one point. If you hit the screen over there, you get two points. If you hit the screen over there, you get three points, whatever. So the first time they play, Trout loses to Ibanez nine to three. And Trout is furious because we just played a game and he lost. And it didn't matter how unimportant the game is. It's still a competition and he lost. So the next day, he comes in and Ibanez had this whole thing figured out. And he goes to Ibanez and says, we're playing that game again today. And Ibanez says, no, I don't want to play today. And he goes, we're playing today. So Trout played against Ibanez and beat him 40 to 4 in the game. <laughs> this is how it works with all of them. And Ibanez told me this story, which I refuse to believe. But Trout confirmed it to me that in batting practice in Tempe, Trout tries to hit a ball into a trash can, which is 420 feet beyond the left field fence. 420 feet from home plate, and it's beyond the left center field fence. So in batting practice, not only is he trying to hit home runs, he's trying to hit them in the trash can. And Abanez told me he saw Trout hit five different balls into a trash can as he was trying to do that. So I said, that's ridiculous, stupidest thing I've ever heard. So I went to Trout, and he very sheepishly said, yeah, I've hit it in the trash can before. <laughs> Cal Ripken was the single most competitive person I've ever met. Try to, try to imagine this. He's in the middle of this impossible streak he's on, and he does this every time he used to go to the old Metrodome in Minneapolis. When infield was over, this is back when everyone used to take infield. Don't start me on that. <laughs> he would run off the field, and then he would see how many strides it would take him to go up the steps that led to the clubhouse level at the Metrodome. It was like 12 steps, giant landing, 12 steps, giant landing, 12 steps. So Ripken of course, is the all-time record holder at the game that he invented. He can get to the top in five strides, in full uniform, a half an hour before a major league game. And he's so happy because he can get to the top in fewer strides than anyone else. So one day, one of his teammates, Rene Gonzalez, gets to the top in five strides. And Ripken is like, oh my gosh, I'm only the co-champion of my own game. He goes back downstairs, gets another running start, and now 15 minutes before the game starts, he runs the steps, does it in four strides, and everything is okay again because he is the champion again at the stupid game that he invented. And I just talked to one of his buddies, Joe Orsalak, the other day. Joe Orsalak was a former teammate with Ripken, and he told me, I didn't know this, Joe Orsak was a ping pong champion for like a four state region as a teenager. So he played Ripken in ping pong one night and he beat him 24 games in a row. And Ripken would not leave the house <laughs> until he won. And Orsak said, he beat me in the 25th game at two o'clock in the morning. And then he went home. <laughs> and because the game is so hard to play, our players will do anything to try to get an edge. In this book, I write about the superstitions of, of the players. And every single player I talked to, except for Adam LaRoche, then of the Nationals, had some sort of superstition. Like Drew Storen, of the, of then of the Nationals, said, well, I don't have any superstitions. So I pushed him on it. And I said, you mean you don't eat anything different? And he goes, well. I had a glass of milk and a grilled cheese sandwich before every game for a year. Does that count? <laughs> yes, that counts. <laughs> and he said, I've worn the exact same pair of underwear for every game for the last five years. Does that count? <laughs> yes, that counts. <laughs> Adam LaRoche told me, my superstition is I have no superstitions. He says to me, look, I got kids at home. How am I going to possibly tell my wife that I can't go watch my son's Little League game because I have to go to the same sandwich shop at 1.30 every single day before a game? He said, I'm not going to do that. But there are players that do that as they attempt 
to get some sort of advantage that night, like Elliot Johnson. Elliot Johnson, great guy. Really smart guy, by the way. Had, a, had this thing where when he played in the field, he had to chew grape-flavored bubble gum. But when he was at the plate, he had to chew watermelon bubble gum because as he said, I repeat, smart guy, the hits are in the watermelon bubble gum. <laughs> so halfway through the season, he gets traded from Tampa Bay to Atlanta. He shows up at the ballpark at like 3 o'clock in the afternoon. First thing he does is go to the clubhouse kids and says, do you have any watermelon flavored bubble gum? And they said, no, we don't. I'm playing tonight. So the kids rush out. They get him some gum. He's happy again. And he looks at me dead in the eye and he goes, and I got a hit that night because I was chewing watermelon <laughs> bubble gum. Same Nationals had Ryan Zimmerman on their team, good hitter. And when he's really going well, he has to shower at the same shower nozzle every single time. They call it the hit shower. So when he's going good, he has to shower there. And everyone knows that's Ryan's shower. So if he walks in the shower and there's somebody else in there, that guy will move because they all know that's the hit shower and Ryan Zimmerman showers there. So Adam Dunn, world's funniest man, saw how badly he was going. So he went to Zimmerman and said, can I use that nozzle, please? That's the hit shower. I need some hits, please. And that's what these guys do because the game is so difficult. These baseball players, there's something wrong with all of them. And they are, by the way, the single most vengeful people that I've ever met in my life. The whole unwritten rules thing, the whole retaliation thing, it's real. It's not as real as it used to be when Bob Gibson used to pitch. Bob Gibson would flip anyone if you looked in a, in a bad way at him, or if you took a big swing off him, he'd knock you down. It's just the way it worked. But it still works that way today, not quite the same. But years ago, a reliever named Ed Farmer, very pedestrian, you know, back end of the bullpen kind of guy, gave up a home run to Wayne Gross, who took his sweet time running around the bases. And Wayne Gross wasn't good enough to take his sweet time running around the bases. So Ed Farmer is furious, and he says, I'm going to get that guy. So he doesn't face him again for three years. <laughs> and this time, they are teammates. <laughs> and it's in spring training, and the first pitch that Farmer throws to Wayne Gross during batting practice in spring training. He hit him right in the middle of the back with 90 miles an hour. And Wayne Gross said, what the hell was that for? And he said, that was for three years ago. <laughs> Way back, there was a pitcher named Stan Williams, big, strong guy, hit a lot of people, vengeful guy, mean guy. But that's what pitchers were back then. And uh, <laughs> he used to uh, carry a, a list of names in his cap. So I asked him, Stan, what was that list of names for? And he goes, oh, those are the guys I got to get. <laughs> and I said, well, why do you keep them in your cap? And he says, so I don't forget any of them. <laughs> so he retires, true story, he retires, and he didn't get all the guys he wanted to get. And he hit one guy at an old timers game. <laughs> ah, I got you. I have the greatest job in the world. What I do for a living is just ridiculously fun. I go to baseball games for a living, and I work at ESPN. And I've covered baseball there with about 60 different analysts, Buck Showalter being my favorite. And we're in what we used to call the war room, 15 televisions up there. And sometimes it was just him and I would watch all the games together. And I can't tell you how many times he would say, did you see that? Did you see that? And I didn't see it because I can't see what he can see. And he would look at me and go, watch, Cardinals will pitch out right here. I can read that. Or he would, and of course, Yadier Molina would pitch out. That's how it worked with Buck Showalter. So one night he just looks at me, typical Buck Showalter, and he goes, uh, you ever seen a great player who's got a lot of freckles? What? I said, what? He goes, have you ever seen a great player who has a lot of freckles? 
I said, Buck, I would never consider even thinking about that. And he says, I say just reflexively, I say, Rusty, stop. He said, a great player, not a good player. <laughs> and the things he can see, like he, he did a thing for us on the air one night where he took the human body and he showed us what a scout is looking for on all parts of the human body. So I started and I said, okay, let's say somebody's walking at you, look at my feet. If someone's walking at you like this, and he goes, no, 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 that's a 10 to two guy. A 10 to two guy, his feet are 10 to two on a clock. He said, we don't want that guy, that's not the athlete. The athlete is the guy with the pigeon toes and the bow legs, that's the guy we're looking for. Then he takes us on television all the way through the human body. We want a high butt on somebody, not a low butt. A high butt, that guy can really run. Low butt, he's probably slow. He gets to the face and he says, whatever you do, never draft anyone who has bright blue eyes. Because if you have bright blue eyes, you can't see as well during day games. Something, of course, I'd never heard before. So Josh Hamilton, about four years after that, has terrible trouble in day games, hitting. So we go ask him, like, what's the deal with your, uh, with your troubles in day games? And he goes, well, I got really bright blue eyes, and I can't see very well during the day. So I was on SportsCenter. They said, have you ever heard that? I said, yeah, Buck told us that four years ago. <laughs> he also told us, never draft an 18-year-old that has a full beard because he's fully grown. He's never going to get any bigger or any stronger. And he said, when we drafted Derek Jeter, he didn't even have to shave. And we knew he was going to get bigger and stronger. And of course, that's precisely what happened. Buck has a billion stories. Some of them are in this book. There's stuff about him in this book. I asked him once, did he ever have Vicente Padilla, you know, kind of a reliever that pitched for a lot of teams? I didn't even think before I asked him. Always a mistake with Buck. So he goes, yeah, we signed Vicente Padilla out of Nicaragua. He came to the signing on a burro. <laughs> so he literally came to the signing on a donkey, whatever that thing is, and they agreed to the amount that they would pay him, and then he says to Buck, I'm going to need 2000 extra dollars because I need to send my burro to a good home, so I need 2000 extra so someone will take good care of my burro. So they gave him the extra $2,000. <laughs> These are the stories that you get when you just ask a simple question of someone like Buck Showalter. Then, of course, there's John Cruck, who I miss terribly. He's no longer with us at ESPN. He's still alive, thank goodness. <laughs> he does Phillies games now, but this is a classic Cruck situation. I'm sitting with him on the, on the ESPN bus a few years ago, and he just looks at me out of the blue, and he said, did I ever tell you about the time I shot a deer in the hot tub? And with Cruck, of course, you have to ask, Crucky, were you in the hot tub? <laughs> Was the deer in the hot tub? Or were both of you in the hot tub? So he says, oh, uh, it was just me in the hot tub. He says, I was in high school. You know, he acknowledges he's a redneck from West Virginia. He said, I'm, I was in high school, and I see a, a deer uh, in the woods. And he says, I've got my shotgun leaning up against the, the hot tub. And then he, like, pauses to look at me as if he thinks I'm going to say, yeah, John, that's where I keep my shotgun. <laughs> so he stands up, typically butt naked. He shoots a deer and sits back down in the hot tub. These are the questions, these are the answers you get from John Crock. And this is why I love working at ESPN so much. And ultimately, I just love being around the ballpark. I still love to talk to the players. I st still love to read the box scores in the morning, whether I cut them out or not. And I knew when I was just a little kid, and I've always been really little, that I wanted to do roughly what I'm doing today. And I knew for sure when I went to the Dallas Morning News in 1981, because the paper I had been with just folded, so I had to go take a new job. So I went there as like a utility infielder. I wasn't uh, the baseball writer or the basketball writer. I was like Jose Okendo, okay? I was a utility infielder. By the way, by the way, Jose Okendo, do you know what he can do with a fungo bat? Do you know what he can do with that? He can pitch batting practice with a fungo bat. 
meaning he can throw it up in the air and he can hit it across the plate for a strike. And he told me I could pitch an entire round of batting practice, I will hit mostly strikes, and I will not hit anybody with a pitch. That's how good he is with a fungo bat. Amazing. Whatever. So I'm the Jose Okendo of the Dallas Morning News. I've been in town about a week, and we got a tip that Ron Meyer, the football coach at SMU, was going to be the next football coach for the New England Patriots. Now this was a gigantic story in town, but none of our football writers were anywhere to be found. So my boss said, Tim, you got to do this story. So they give me Ron Meyer's number. I call him on their phone 50 times. Clearly the phone is off the hook. And my boss goes, Tim, you have to go to his house. You have to go find him and ask him these questions. Well, again, I'd only been in town a week. I didn't know how to get to my house, let alone his house. And I didn't know Ron Meyer from Oscar Meyer at this point. So I finally get to his door. It's like 10 o'clock at night. I knock on the door, and remember, it's 1981. I was looking a lot younger then than I look today, and if it's possible, I was even smaller then than I am today. So I knock on the door, and he comes to the door, and I say, hi, I'm Tim Kirkjian with the Dallas Morning News. And he goes, oh, okay, how much do we owe you this month? It was so funny, I didn't know whether to laugh or to cry because I'm scared to death. I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm 12 years old covering uh, a college football thing. So the bottom line is he lets me in. He lies about everything. Are you going to the Patriots? No. Have you been contacted by them? No. So I go back to my apartment. I call my office and say, here's the story. He's not going. Then Ron Meyer calls me in my apartment. I don't know how he found me and said, your competitor from the other paper just showed up, and I told him the truth, and I didn't want to get you in trouble your first week on the job. So here's the real truth and the real story, and I got the story in on time. And I said to myself, though, all right, I, everything turned out OK, but instead of chasing around college football coaches in the middle of the night, I'm going back to baseball no matter what, because that's where I'm most comfortable, and that's what I love the most. And now it's closing in on 40 years that I've done this, and I hope I get to do it for 40 more years. So thanks so much for coming to see me tonight. Thanks so much for buying all these books. And this is my favorite part of any time I do anything like this, are the questions from you. Okay, I've been to every World Series game since 1980. I've voted for the Hall of Fame for the last 27 years. I've been to every All-Star game since 1980. I've met virtually every, I have met every great player in baseball over the last 38 years or so. So this is what I love so much is when I hear anything from you guys about any question, I'll do my best to answer anything. Just raise your hand and I'll call on you. Yes, Tamara. I remembered her name. How about that? Um, well, since the box score debacle is now over, I don't have to do that every, every day, no. Um, although I do have a superstition that I do now, I still do a day-by-day -day book, which I write down every single day. This is 28 years of this now. Every day I write down every score of every game that every team plays, winning and losing pitcher, where they are in the standings. I just wrote down three straight two to one victories for the Cardinals, okay? That's, the, that's why you do this, that's why I do this. When I can see it, when I write it down with my own two hands, I can see it better and I could absorb it better. And that's my superstition is I've done that thing, that day by day book, it takes me about 20 minutes a day, every day for 28 years and I haven't missed a day on that either. Again, pathetic beyond words, but it works for me, so. Um, I stay up late as much as I can, but I have some duties at home. No one needs to know this, but my poor mom is 93. She lives in our house. She's got Alzheimer's. I take care of her with some help from my brother. Um, so we do our best. So some nights I'm taking care of my mother, not watching the Giants against the Rockies, and that's okay, too. Yes, way back there. Uh, well, Earl Weaver is 
the best manager that I've ever been around. And Earl from St. Louis, of course, is just a little bit taller than me and just had a different way of looking at things than anyone else. He hated the sacrifice bunt because we only get 27 outs and we're not giving away any outs here, okay? And it used to infuriate him when the other team would want to bunt and his pitcher wouldn't throw a strike. And he would scream, they're giving us an out. Take the out. He just had a different, simplistic look at things. Pitching, defense, three-run homers. And he also had a way with the players that was just not good sometimes. But he didn't care, OK? For instance, he used to have an outfielder on his team named Pat Kelly. And Pat Kelly decided, like midway through his career, that he's going to become a minister while he's still playing baseball. So Pat Kelly decides to wait for the perfect moment to go talk to Earl. And he finds the moment, and he goes to him, and he says, Earl, I'm going to walk with the Lord. And Earl said, I'd rather you walk with the bases loaded. <laughs> he's the best manager I've ever been around. Yes. Um, yeah, Bob Eucher might be the funniest person I've ever met in my entire life. I spoke at the Brewers' midwinter banquet about uh, 15 years ago, and he was the MC. It was unbelievably funny, and he winged the whole thing. He just made it up as he went. It was hysterically funny. And of course, when I, I'm older than most people here, but when I was growing up, I would watch him on the Johnny Carson show and The Tonight Show, and he was incredibly funny with that wry sense of humor. They asked, Johnny asked him once, you know, what's, what's the biggest thrill you've ever had in baseball? And he said, well, I got, a, I got out of a rundown against the Mets once. <laughs> Number one thrill. <laughs> Number two, he said, I, I saw a fan fall out of the upper deck in Philadelphia. <laughs> Those were his two greatest thrills. Uh, who was the other guy, Bob Euchre and? Yogi Berra. Oh, Yogi Berra. Oh, my God. Yogi Berra just died. By the way, the second greatest catcher, in my mind, after Johnny Bench, of all time, is Yogi Berra. And he's this tall, okay? He struck out, by the way, 12 times in one season. Hit 28 homers, struck out 12 times. So when you watch Byron Buxton strike out 17 times, in his team's first seven games. Remember, <laughs> Yogi Berra struck out 12 times for an entire season. Yogi also, this sounds apocryphal, but it's true, drove in 23 runs and a doubleheader once in the minor leagues. 23 runs. And he hit one homer and 23 RBIs and a doubleheader. 12 in the first game, 11 in the second. You know, in typical Yogi, I said, Yogi, how could that happen? He said, well, every time I came up, the bases were loaded. And I had a double or a triple, and that was it. Yogi's one of the greats of all time, and when he left us, that was one of the great losses ever. Well, I think he was the most beloved player in baseball at the time of his death, and he will always be beloved. And by the way, for me, one of the four, five greatest Yankees ever. And boy, do I get in trouble when I talk about that. We'll talk about something else, yes. Um, boy, the Pete Rose Hall of Fame thing, it's so hard. Um, if Pete Rose were on the ballot, I would vote for him. Because it seems to me the violations were as a manager, not as a player. So I go on TV, this is 10 years ago, and I say I would vote for Pete Rose for the Hall of Fame. Frank Robinson, who knows me, he likes me. And I like him, I've known him for a long time, screams at me when I see him. And I said, what, what, what are you so mad about? He said, I can't believe you said that you would vote for that guy. If he gets in the Hall of Fame, I will never go back to the Hall of Fame for anything ever if he's in the club because he violated the number one rule that you don't bet on baseball. One of my old time scouts told me, if Pete Rose had killed a man, it would be less of a violation than what he did. I said, Mel, please. 
And he goes, Tim, you're not old enough to have been around for the aftermath of the Black Sox scandal. If we're not sure if the game's on the up and up, if the ball goes through Buckner's legs and we're not sure if he's trying, then none of this matters. That's how important cleaning up the gambling in the game was in the late teens and early 20s. So I would vote for Pete Rose because he was a great, great player. But my guess is if we put him on the ballot today, he wouldn't get 75% of the vote, which is hard to get. And I don't see any way that the commissioner is going to reinstate him. And it's going to take some act from someone else many years from now before Pete Rose gets in the Hall of Fame. But he's still got the hits, and he'll always have the hits. Oh, Sparky Lyle. Um, uh, I don't have a good one because I didn't cover him. But when I was a kid, my dad grew up in Watertown, Mass. And we went to my dad's high school. And there was like a game being played, but it was a practice being played. And Sparky Lyle, in the middle of his career, was throwing bat in practice to these kids at this dinky little high school field. It was like the coolest thing ever. Yeah, wish I had a better one than that. That's all I got. Yes? Let's say uh, we're playing baseball. I've seen a single argument with Joe Tyler and Danny from the Cubs Orioles. The question is about replay. Um, I'm not the biggest fan in the world of replay. Look, I understand we're getting more calls right, and I understand that's really important. But it's taken too long. We're slowing the game down. And for some reason, we're on this bent now that the game is really boring, and that if we don't speed it up, no one's going to watch ever again. I personally think, yes, I would like to cut out some of the dead time in the game. But to me, the game is still really good. And after last year's World Series, to start saying baseball's kind of boring. Did you watch the World Series? Are you kidding me? I mean, that was fantastic. So I think replay needs to be refined. It needs, it needs to move quicker. They need to be better at it. It's not an easy thing to do. So I was told after three years, it would be perfect. And it's been three years, and it's not perfect. So we're not going to get rid of it, but we have to make it quicker and more efficient. Yes, little one. Who is the best Cubs player of all time? Um, that's a really good question. Ernie Banks? Am I right? Is it Ernie Banks? <laughs> I think it's Ernie Banks, right? Am I missing someone? I had to do this for all 30 teams. It was really good finding the greatest Tampa Bay Ray ever a few years ago. <laughs> um, I would say it was Ernie Banks, who we forget won the MVP as a shortstop two years in a row and could have won it in 1960, a third straight year. He was a much better defensive player than people gave him credit for. He moved to first because of some health issues. And I wrote his obit. Boy, I hate doing that. God, it's so sad. But I wrote his obit for ESPN.com, and I quoted Billy Williams that Billy rode to the ballpark with Ernie like every day. And I said to Billy, Billy, he could not have been that happy. And he goes, trust me, he was that happy every day. He said, I finally had to stop riding in with him because he was too happy every day. <laughs> I think it's Ernie Banks. It's a good question, though. Yes? Favorite baseball movie? Um, I'm going to try not to cry about this. This is really close to home. Field of Dreams is my favorite baseball movie. Sorry, it's about a father and a son. My dad was a really good player. My dad taught me to love the game. He had a great feel for the game. He taught me how to play the game. I got two brothers in the Baseball Hall of Fame at Catholic University, and it's all because of my father. So at the end of that movie, sorry, when he has the catch with his dad, it's just too much for me. It's a beautiful movie, and it will always, always be my favorite baseball movie. Yes. Yeah, it's, the question is about the McGuire steroid bond steroid Sosa thing. Look, I was here for 60, 61, and 62 at Bush Stadium, all right? That happened, OK? And for people to say, we have to disqualify that because that no longer has any meaning, I'm sorry. I can't think that way. 
That moved me. I wrote about that, and I wrote well about that because that was some great stuff that we saw. Now, was it right? Of course not. Was it legal? Of course not. But really, people have been doing this in baseball for 150 years. They've been corking bats. They've been scuffing baseballs. They've been doing red juice. They've been doing greenies. They've been doing whatever it takes to get an advantage. Does that make it right? Of course not. Would I tell my son to do that? Of course not. But to not acknowledge that this is the way it's always been. And now to look at McGuire and Sosa and say, I can't believe what those guys did. I'm disqualifying everything about that. I, I just can't go there. And this is the issue, though. I am a Hall of Fame voter for 27 years. And I have to make a decision on Barry Bonds and Roger Clemens and a bunch of other guys. And I'm not sure what to do. So in the absence of, of real proof on certain things, I vote for Bonds and Clemens. And they're starting to move up. It's not my job to get them in the Hall of Fame. I would just feel, I would feel like a hypocrite if I didn't vote for them. And yet it's not easy to vote for them. This is the hardest thing I've ever had to do in 38 years of covering baseball is figure out what to do with these guys because they clearly did something they shouldn't have done and yet it seems to me there was this tacit agreement going on in the mid 90s where everyone was doing this nobody was checking and now we're looking at it like oh my god I can't believe somebody did that remember a few years ago Derek Jeter got hit right here and the ball hit the knob of his bat and he pretended that it hit his hand. And he went like this, and he deceived the umpire, and they gave him first base. I could not believe the outrage in this country that Derek Jeter had deceived the umpire. <laughs> That's what he's taught to do, probably in high school, but certainly in pro ball. This is how it works. Look, this is a hard game played by hard men. And if you don't understand that part of it, then you're watching something that I'm not watching. Yes? I have a small question. Basically, uh, I know how you feel about Glenn, but KJ wanted to know who was the better hitter between Glenn and Bonds. So maybe compare and contrast Glenn and Bonds. And then in today's world, maybe Trout and Harper. Who's going to come out and who's going to be the better player? Who's going to be the answer to throw out the question? All right. Well, the question is who is better, Tony Gwynn or Wade Boggs? They were both great. Wade Boggs, true story, popped out to an infielder three times for an entire season. Three. Checked by me. That's unbelievable. And his on-base percentage was ridiculous. Lifetime 328 hitter. Tony Gwynn was even better. Tony Gwynn used to write on his, the tongue of his shoes, 5.5. That reminded him that when in doubt, He's going to hit a line drive or a hard ground ball to the 5.5 hole, which is in between the third baseman, the 5, and the shortstop, the 6. And he could do that. For a five-year period, Tony Gwynn batted 335 when he had two strikes on him. Major League average is roughly 180 with two strikes. He batted 335. And the only guy that batted higher during that five-year period using all his strikes was, or all his pitches, was Mike Piazza. That's how good Tony Gwynn was. And again, tiny little hands, used the smallest bat you can ever imagine. If you go to bat day at the ballpark and they, they pass out those little bats, that's the kind of bat Tony Gwynn used <laughs> because he had these little hands and he needed, a, he needed control of the bat. So, 1994, he bats 394. He told me he used one bat for an entire season, using it, only keeping it out against a really, really tough left-hander, Jeff Passero, somebody that might come in and break his bat. Otherwise, he used one bat for an entire season. The next year, in spring training of 1995, he broke that bat on a backfield in spring training, taking BP against one of his coaches, Rob Picciolo. And Tony looked at me and said, I almost started to cry. <laughs> That's how great Tony Gwynn was. Uh, as for Harper against Trout, um, uh, Mike Trout is Mickey Mantle come back to life. I hope we understand what we're watching here. First off, his neck is this big, okay? 
and he can run like a deer. It's amazing. He's a physical freak. And besides hitting balls into trash cans while he's calling it, he also finds at Fenway when he goes there, there's a little hole in the scoreboard there. And before games, he will just play around in the outfield and see if from 80 feet away he can throw a ball through that tiny little hole. That's who he is. He is going to be, at this pace, one of the five greatest players of all time, if not better than that. I still think Babe Ruth is the best player ever. Babe Ruth just decided, okay, I'm not going to pitch anymore because he was the best pitcher in the league at the time and then became the best hitter ever. He still, Babe Ruth, has as many career shutouts as Pedro Martinez. Think about that for a second. I think Trout is better than Harper. He's had a better career than Harper. Keep in mind, Tony Gwynn is the, I mean, uh, Mike Trout is the only player to finish in the top two of the MVP voting, first two full seasons, uh, to do it his first two years. He's done it five years in a row now, when no one else has done it two years. That's how good he is. Harper's great. He will tear your throat out before he will let you beat him. And that's why I love that guy, too. Now, he gets a little out of control sometimes. He's off to a great start. The bottom line is both of those guys are going to hit 500 homers, and both of those guys 15 years from now, we're going to be telling people we saw them play when they were 20 years old, and it was breathtaking then, and it's breathtaking now. Yes? I think Bob Gibson would just throw up at the thought of today's pitching. <laughs> the first thought, the pitching today, seriously, has never been better. These guys throw way harder than they've ever thrown as a group, ever. They all have secondary pitches, slider, changeup. Phenomenal how great the pitching is today. What I was saying about Bob Gibson, who I love, you have no idea how great that, you do know, you do know how great he was. He would finish what he started. But in today's game, we tell our kids, when they come to pro ball, five innings, 100 pitches, then you're out of here. I had a guy, I went to a game in Washington a few years ago, and the pitcher, I'm not even going to mention his name, it's not important, he motions to the manager. It's in the sixth inning. He's pitched five and a third. And he's, the manager has to come out and say, what? He goes, I can't pitch anymore. And he says, what, are you hurt? He goes, no, I'm tired. I got to come out. <laughs> 97 pitches. Oh, my God. Bob Gibson finishes what he starts. And today, I just wish we would take our pitchers and say, look, we're going to go a little longer this time. But the way things work, we have eight-man bullpens. We pay relievers an enormous amount of money. And those relievers are really good. Lance Berkman used to tell me, he'd say, every night, someone comes in from the bullpen throwing 95 miles an hour, and I've never even heard of him. That's how it works now. These. Uh, uh, Hitters will tell you, we, we, we got to get the starter out of the game and get into the bullpen. And the hitters are now saying, why would we want to do that? Be that's how good the relievers are. So the pitching in the game has completely changed. And I think it's really unfortunate that, you know, Kurt Schilling was one of our big horses. And Warren Spahn had almost as many complete games after he turned 40 as Kurt Schilling had in his career. And Kurt Schilling is considered one of our war horses because that's what we've done to our starting pitchers. Give us six, see you later, then we're going to bring in an army of relievers, all of whom are good. So I'm not arguing that it doesn't work because pitching today is spectacularly overpowering. It's amazing, which explains the strikeout rate. Again, it's, it's just incredible what we have now, okay? Every year now, we have more 100 strikeout batters, 150 or so per year, than we had from 1900 to 1960 combined. Think about that. 1970, Joe Torre goes to Lou Brock on the final day of the season and says, Lou, you're not in the lineup. What's wrong? I need you in there today. I got 99 RBIs. I need you in there so I can knock in my 100th run. You're my guy. And Lou says, I can't play. My legs hurt me. So he looks at the numbers, Joe Torre does, and Lou Brock has 99 strikeouts. And he's not going to strike out 100 times. And now we have 100 strikeouts at the All-Star break by several guys, several of whom are playing in the All-Star game. That's how it works today. A, dominant pitching, and B, because our hitters are not like Tony Gwynn, 
with a plan and a bunch of different swings. They have one beautiful swing. Long story. Yes. I think you had your hand up several times. Yes. Sorry. Yeah, I think Albert, I think it's a fair assessment that his first 10 years were the greatest first 10 years of anyone ever. And nobody hit at least 30 homers for their first 10 years like he did. He had 403 homers after 10 years. Nobody else had ever done that. He, I hope we all remember how great he was because he ascended, at least for me, to the second greatest first baseman of all time after Lou Gehrig. By the way, go back and look at those Lou Gehrig numbers sometimes. Oh my gosh. For Albert Pools to be second to Lou Gehrig is really saying something. And Albert really cared and really tried and really wanted to be great every day. So the story about him was his first year as a rookie. Remember, he kind of came out of nowhere. I'm on baseball tonight with Mike McFarland, one of my favorite guys. And he told this story that he owns a batting cage in Kansas City. And he said, Every single day, this big guy came into our batting cage and pumped quarter after quarter after quarter and hit like all day long. And he never said a word to anybody. He just hit and he hit and he hit. And Mike McFarland kept saying, I don't know who that guy is, but he can get really hit. And then Albert Pujols made the roster. We're watching the game on TV. Mike McFarland and I, and he goes, oh my God, that's the guy in the batting cage. <laughs> It was Albert Pujols. <laughs> Love that. Yes. All right, we're down to two more questions. All right, you guys over there, great pressure here. That is correct. Johnny Bench could hold seven baseballs in one hand. I saw him do it. I asked him to do it, and he did it for me. His hands, I mean, my hands are big for a little guy. His hands are ten times as big as mine. Yes, that is true. Seven baseballs for Johnny Bench. What else? Oh, I, I've never heard that one. The question was, did, did Johnny Bench catch a ball barehanded in a major league game from Jim Maloney, who was tiring at the time? I'm going to say that's apocryphal. I'm going to say that that didn't happen. With Johnny Bench's hands, you, you never discount. But on a serious note with Johnny Bench, I was telling this to Alan earlier. At the Hall of Fame, the greatest day a Hall of Famer can possibly have is the Friday night before the induction on Sunday. And that's where the Hall of Famer gets to have dinner in a special room in Cooperstown, the, the new inductee that year, with the other Hall of Famers. And nobody else is allowed in the room. Nobody else from the Hall, nobody else. It's just dinner with the greatest players of all time. And Johnny Bench is the MC of the evening. He makes everybody laugh. He makes everybody smile. But he also makes everyone understand what we're doing here, and how select a group this is. And I told Barry Larkin, when he went to the Hall of Fame, I said, Barry, from what I'm told, that Friday night will be the greatest night you've ever had. And after his Friday night, he came back and he said, that was the greatest night I've ever had. And it was all mostly because of Johnny Bench. So whatever you hear about Johnny Bench, multiply it by 10, he was that great. Last question, yes. The question is how, this is a good way, place to finish, and I hope I do this justice. 2016 season, how would I rank that? Look, I'm not rooting for anybody or any team or anything. I am rooting only for the story, because I'm supposed to be, and I am, an objective journalist. But I said all these years, when the Cubs finally win, it's going to be the greatest story 
that we've, any of us have ever written. And that's precisely what it was. And when you look at how that season played out, and then how sensational that postseason was, and how unbelievably good that World Series was with the Game 7, and then the whole dueling curses, 1948-1908, the whole Tito Francota angle, the whole Theo Epstein angle, the whole thing put together. And then Game 7 was the most watched baseball game in the history of the sport. And then they gave us that game to watch. I'm saying, at the risk of overstating this, and I don't think I am, I think that was the greatest night in Major League history, or the most important night, or the best night. I don't even know what the term is. All I know is I've never seen anything like that, and neither have you, and neither has anybody else who's alive right now. Because of the time it took for the Cubs to get there, the incredible way the Indians played, and just the way the whole game seven was. And without being corny, this is why I cover baseball. Is I got to go to that game. It was so <laughs> good. So thanks so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love you. Huh? <laughs> Thank, thank you all so much for being here. Thank you, Tim. Amazing. Uh, remember, the rivalry exhibit is open a bit longer tonight if you want to go through it. And if you want to order books for, uh, for Tim to sign, uh, please, we have that ability outside in the lobby as well. So thanks again for being here. Thank you so much, Tim. Thank you. All right, sir.